for us. And now, loving God, we give you glory, we give you praise, we give you thanks today. Oh, loving Jesus, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated this morning. It is great to be in the house of the Lord on a beautiful Sunday morning. Amen. amen. It's better than what it was last Sunday morning. Thank God for that. Amen for that. So we do welcome each and every one of you. Pray for those. There are some that are, um, that are have, having um, formations this morning. And so they're getting different, different deployment things. And they, they're in formation today. There's like three or four that are doing that. And then also um, there's another unit because of drinking and driving and different things. They're getting smoked. So you know how it is. They, one person gets messes up. Everybody has to pay the price. So a lot of crazy things going on. But you know what? How many are glad that Jesus is still alive? Amen. Amen. And then we had made mention about Duhai coming. He was supposed to be here tonight, but he won't be arriving now until the 22nd. You understand that he's coming out of the Ukraine, and uh, his, his bus, he took plenty of time, but his bus was like nine hours late getting into Warsaw, so he missed his flight. So a big change of plans, but he'll be here around the 22nd. So pray for him as he travels. Amen? How many glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Amen. This time the ushers are going to come to help us to receive our Sunday morning tithe and our Sunday morning worship offering. Now, understand what I said, our Sunday morning tithe and our Sunday morning worship offering. And um, Christians pay tithe. Amen. Amen. That's what the Bible tells us to do. And I think some of you may be not understanding what tithe is. Tithe is not an elective. It's not like a college course to where we pick and choose what we want. That's like trying to pick and choose the commandments of God. But, you know, tithe is a tenth of our gross income that we give to God when we get paid. And uh, we can do that a couple different ways. There are tithe envelopes in the pews. Or we can go online at www.myntcc.org slash junctioncityks. That's our website. There's an online giving button there. And also, you can also pay your tithe at dollar sign on Cash App at dollar sign uh, NTCC Junction City. Now, um, when you do pay your tithe online or on Cash App, be sure you label it tithe because if it's not tithe, we consider it an offering. And there is a difference because he said bring your tithe and offerings. Offerings are a free will thing. Tithe is what God tells us to do. I pay tithe. Christians pay tithe. And so this is how God has instituted to take care of his work. And not only that, we worship God with our giving. Amen? Amen. We worship God with our giving. And then if you would just believe God and pay your tithe, you'll be blessed beyond measure. And sometimes in our minds, in our minds, we think there is no way that I could pay my tithe. There's no way I could do this. It just is not going to work out. Well, maybe because it's not working out is because you're not paying your tithe. You ever think of it that way? Maybe things are not working out because you're not doing it. Now, you think I'm crazy, but I, I, I've done this now for 40 years. All right, so I'm talking from experience, and, and you think there is no way. There is just no way. If I do this, I, I, I won't be able to afford to pay attention. Right. So the thing about it is when you trust God and believe God, don't ask me how God does it because I'm not God. All right. And he is a miracle working God. And, and, and you do it. He's like, OK, God, I don't know. And guess what? God makes a way. Well, how does he do it? I don't know. I ain't God, but I do know that God takes care of it. All right. So you give to God. And, and, I, and the Bible says that if we do this, he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you. So so I would be remiss as a pastor not to tell you to pay your tithes so you can get blessed. I can't afford it, preacher. You can't afford not to. All right. So you give to God and God will bless you. And uh, I really believe that. Put God to the test. So we pay our tithe when we get paid. If you get paid uh, once a month or twice a month or whenever you pay that tithe, God will bless you for it, all right? And this is how things are taken care of. And for those of you that are faithful in your tithe and in your offerings to the Lord, God bless you. And we appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord. And we really try to be mindful of how, how God's money is spent. And we, we want to take care of it. You give it. And God bless you. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your faithful giving as unto the Lord. Praise God. Brother. You know your name, Ron. Please pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give unto you. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings we will receive. We ask you, Lord, to bless the gift and the giver according to your word. In Jesus' precious and powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen.
amen. And really sincerely from my heart, God bless you. Thank you for your giving. Amen. I don't take it lightly. And I, when people uh, obey God and trust the Lord, we don't take it lightly. We do appreciate your giving. And I'm not just saying that for empty words. We are very, very thankful for those of you that support the work of the Lord here. And, and we use that tithe money to, to pay the bills, the electricity, the heat, the air conditioning as is applicable, and on and on and on. The insurance and of course, and, and the church feels the same struggles that you feel when your insurance, your home insurance goes up and your taxes go up and stuff like that. We feel the same thing. Our insurance rates just went up here and, uh, you know, just glory, right? So we, we're in the same thing. We're in the same boat together, right? All right. So praise God. Thank you for your giving. God bless you. I'd like to read to you one verse of scripture this morning. One that is very familiar, one that is used often, found in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. It's a great verse of scripture. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And I'd like to preach to you today on a title of a message, Jesus Christ forever the same. Jesus Christ forever the same. Reverend Myers, sir, would you please pray? Amen. So the verse of scripture that I shared with you this morning shows us the vital truth that our God does not change. Praise God that he does not change. He is by his very nature an unchangeable God. That means because God is unchangeable, that means that he is as powerful as he ever was. Uh, praise God that we serve a powerful Lord. That means he is as loving. How many are thankful that our God is loving? That he is merciful. Hallelujah for that. He is full of grace as holy and as much as in control as he has ever been. I want you to know that our God does not change. He is still God. He will always be God. And he is absolutely unchangeable. And thanks be unto the Lord today that you are the same. Now what changes? You and I change. Sometimes you change, you know, people change uh, from one minute to the next. One minute they're all happy, the next minute they're mad, and then they're sad, and then they're depressed, uh, and then they're happy, and then they're joyful, and then they're mad. How many know what I'm talking about? You might change emotions several times in this service today. But the fact that God does not change is essential doctrine of Christianity. So, so why, why is this so important, the fact knowing that God is unchangeable? Because change implies imperfection. And God is absolutely perfect. If God was like us and we change, like I said, sometimes we change with the weather, right? Or whatever the case may be. We're like Kansas weather. One minute it's cold and then it's hot. One minute it's dry, then it's wet. How many know what I'm talking about, right? And so God, because he does not change, shows us that our God is absolutely perfect. We serve a perfect God this morning. Praise the Lord. That means, therefore, he cannot change ever. And this truth we find is laid out for us in the scriptures. Bible tells us in Psalm 90 in verse 2, he said, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth in the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. He does not change. Malachi Chapter 3, verse 6, he said, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. He does not change. Praise the Lord. James 1, 17. I like this verse of scripture. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Praise the Lord. All the good things that we have come from the Lord. Amen? No, preacher, I just got good luck. No, it's not good luck. We have a good God. We have a good Jesus that knows how to bless us. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That tells us that God does not vary. He doesn't turn. He doesn't change. He is an unchanging God. 
Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Aren't you glad today that we are serving the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the ending? We have our trust and our hope in Jesus this morning. So I want to take this passage from Hebrews, which reveals that Jesus never changes. And today, with the help of the Lord, I want to begin to share with you a few areas where he is absolutely unchangeable. So guess what? Jesus will never change in regards to, number one, his power. We serve a powerful God. Matthew 28, verse 18 tells us, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So that tells us, this verse tells us, that Jesus has been given power. So what does this mean? Simply stated, Jesus is the all-powerful Lord. Praise God. Now notice it said that this power had been given unto him. This simply means that at some point in time, we don't know when it was that God the Father gave Jesus his power and authority. That means that he has every, everything that he needs to rule. He has everything that he has to bless us, uh, to redeem us, to save us, to forgive us. Uh, he has all power and authority. In other words, it is God's will, the Heavenly Father's will, that Jesus possesses all the power in heaven and in earth, and nothing can change that fact. I don't care what people believe. Believe. I don't care what people say. I don't care what Google says. I, I don't care what you hear on YouTube. All I know is that my God is all powerful. He always was and he always will be. Can someone say a great big amen? amen? We see his creative power. Now, a lot of people don't know this to understand that Jesus was the agent of creation. Bible tells us in John chapter 1 and verse 3. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Who created everything? Jesus did it. Amen. Wait a minute. Did not God the Father do it? No, Jesus created it. Amen. Remember by the power that was given to him by his Father. So, well, no, 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 no. No, read the Bible. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. I'm glad that we serve a God that knows how to put things together, a God that is able to keep us. I want you to know that Jesus created it for us. All right, so God has this power. Jesus has this power. Power that is working in and around us. Now, I might talk about it here a little while, but you know what? Why don't we begin to tap into the power that God's given to us? We walk around defeated. We walk around with attitudes. We walk around with all these things in our life. Well, we don't have to do this uh, because our God is a powerful God. And we have to allow this same power to work in and around us. Uh, it's time that we really believe the power of God. It's time that we stand upon the promises of God and say, wait a minute. I have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. I have been saved. His spirit lives on the inside of me. That means I need to employ, I need to use, I need to utilize that power of God that is in me. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly of, of all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. We need to let that power move. Praise the Lord. Yeah. 
Pastor, you don't understand. I don't have any power. I give in to sin. I give in to desires. I give in to lust. I give in to these things. But when you have the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside working in you, you don't have to worry about giving in. You don't have to worry about succumbing to the lies of Satan. We don't have to worry about giving in to the lures of the world. Why? Because there's a power that works on the inside of us. It's not our power. It's not our ability. But it is the power of a living God that enables us to live a victorious life for Jesus Christ. That's why we can say with all assurance of our heart that Jesus is able. Praise God. Let's go on. Then we also see his, all right, his creative power and then his redemptive power. His power. What does it mean to redeem when we say that we have been redeemed? And now a lot of times we utilize, we as Christians and we as preachers, we have a tendency to utilize words that nobody knows what we're talking about. So we say we ha he has redemptive power. That means he has power to buy us back or to deliver us from sin with his blood. He paid for us with his blood. He has redeemed us. That means that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto my problems. Oh, because it has finished my faith. No. So many times, come on, we sit around, we have a pity party. Stop looking at me like you never done that. Oh, Pastor, you just don't understand. I am tempted on every hand. I, I am pressed beyond measure. What am I going to do? Wait a minute. I'll tell you what to do. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that is set before him, praise God, he did this for us. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to know right now, he's there, he's alive, he rose again on the third day. He paid the price for you and I. He paid the price for my sin. He paid the price for your sin. I want you to know... He's the only one in whom salvation can be found. A lot of people, they, they try all kinds of things to, to gain favor and to go to heaven. And, and, and they make it so hard upon themselves. Uh, and, and they're looking and they're searching. And, well, I'm a good guy and I give to charity and, and I help little old ladies across the street. Or I'm an Eagle Scout or whatever the case may be. Well, that's all well and good to do those things. Uh, but without Jesus, you have no salvation. Salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. Can I say it again? That, Je that Jesus is the only one that we can find salvation. Amen. Bible tells us in Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You're not going to get saved by Buddha. You're not going to get saved by Muhammad. Islam is not the answer. All these other things are not the answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the one. There's no other that we can make it to heaven. And guess what? Because he does not change. That means that he will never ever lose his saving power now understand that well that was a long time ago preacher well that's all right it's a long time ago he'll never lose his saving power hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto god by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That means, that means, as I already told you, he's right there, the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for you and I. And if we would just come to him, if we would just call upon him, say, God, I need to be saved. God, I need to be forgiven. God, I need a restoration. I just need something real in my life. And that's exactly what we need. We need a reality, a relationship with the Lord, and we can get
get up from a place of prayer and say, man, I don't know, I can't explain it, but I know that my God has saved me. I've applied the blood of Jesus to my life. I know my sins have been washed away as far as the east is from the west. And now, praise God, I am on my way to heaven. And then we see his protective power. Jesus is still the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 11. He said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He's the shepherd. We're the sheep. He gave his life for us. Not only is he the good shepherd, he will care for the sheep until they all arrive safely home. I like this because the fact that, that he saves us, he doesn't just throw us out there and leave us by ourselves. Right. He doesn't say, all right, <laughs> hope you make it. See ya. No, he doesn't do that. He saves us. He has kept us. He'll keep us safe. And we can read even in the 23rd Psalm where the Lord promises to care for a sheep in every conceivable manner. It doesn't matter where we go. It doesn't matter if we're on the mountaintop or if we're in the valley of death. We know that, that guess what? God is going to go with us every step of the way. He cares for you. He loves you. He wants to take care of you. Listen, listen, if he done it for others, he'll do it for you. You're no different. We're all the same. We're all from the same mud, the same muck in the mire. And if God can take care of me, I believe that God can take care of you. Can I get a witness? How do you know, preacher? Because the Bible tells us. That there is no respect of persons with God. That means it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't matter your rank. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or from the country or from the city. It just doesn't really matter. God loves all of us. Can I get a witness? God loves you. If you don't remember anything today, remember this, that God loves you. Now listen to this. If you stay true. And if you stay faithful to him, guess what? He's going to stay true and faithful to you, and he'll see you all the way to glory. I, I, I don't know about you, but I want to go to heaven. I was telling Saul and Reverend Myers yesterday, we were talking about the rapture and Jesus coming back. We don't know when he's coming back. And I said, well, if he comes back today, I told Reverend Myers, I just go ahead and have church. It'll be all right. He's like, no. He said, no, I'm going to go to heaven. It's up to you, Saul. Are you going to go to heaven? Okay. Don't put me on the spot. What's going on? The thing about it is, we need to be ready. And so we need to be faithful. How, how in the world, how in tarnation, do you expect God to be faithful to you if you're not faithful to him? Oh, it's quiet now. And everybody wants God to move on the scene when things are going wrong. And we want to say, God, do this. And God, do this. And, and God, I need this. And, and God, I'm sick. Or my mom is sick. My grandma's sick. I have a need. But what about you being faithful to God at all times? I understand how people expect all the blessings of God when they're not faithful to the Lord. And I think we need to be faithful to God and, and, and say, well, Pastor, I'm faithful to the Lord. But some people have a strange way of showing faithfulness to God. Are you still with me right now? Jesus, forever the same. And if we stay true, and if we walk up rightly before him, he said he would give us the desires of our heart. You know what? I think there, there are some that need to look at their hearts and their lives, all of us. Let's just not say some, all of us. We need to look at our life. We need to look at our hearts and say, God, am I as faithful as I should be to you? Am I faithful to you? Am I faithful to, to what you want done? Am I faithful to your ministry? Am I faithful to, to all the things in our life? And then we want the blessings of God. Think about it. Let's go on. Jesus forever the same. His power and now his promises. Romans 4 and 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. All right, so in this verse, we see the word promised. It describes an action which is viewed as having been completed in the past. 
once and for all, not needing to be repeated. To put it very, very simply, when God makes a promise, he has no need to repeat himself because his promises are good forever. He has promised. We need to be fully persuaded. How many are fully persuaded this morning that our God is able? There are some promises that you and I have from God. Things in which the Lord will not change his mind. I like this one. He has promised to save us. Praise God. We all needed saving. There might be some that need saving. I'm not passing judgment. Pass your own judgment upon yourself, all right? The promise is clear. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall just call upon the name of the Lord every six months. I got the wrong version today, don't I? For whosoever. I mean, that means me. That means you. That means poor people, old people, rich people, young people. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. When a lost sinner comes to Jesus by faith, they are saved by grace, and they're prepared for heaven. Saved by grace. Hallelujah. We're not saved by our good works. We're not saved by the... Now, I was talking to, uh, to, the, to Saul about it yesterday. We, we are not saved by coming to church. We're not saved by praying. We're not saved. Well, we get saved by praying. We're not saved by reading your Bible. Because he, can I, can I use you for a second? Sure. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> All right. I asked him if he was ready to go to heaven. He said, no, I haven't finished reading my Bible yet. Well, the good thing is, is that he's reading his Bible. Amen. That's a good thing, yeah. right? He has, he's following one of those schedules that I have in the back. So that's a good thing. And I said... Uh, you don't, the Bible doesn't say you have to read the whole Bible before you can go to heaven. Right. A lot of people ought to be thankful for that. Because some of you have been saved for a long time. You fully haven't read it yet. Uh-huh. Is this still working? All right, so praise God. But the thing about it is, I said, we do not, I told him, I said, we don't go to church. We don't, we don't uh, uh, pay our tithe. I say we don't give an offerings. We don't read our Bibles to be saved. I said because we are saved, we go to church. Because we are saved, we read our Bibles. Because we are saved, we pay our tithe. Because we are saved, we give an offerings. We talked about that. I explained it to him because we do those things because we are saved. But those are works. Those are not the things that save us. Jesus saves us by His blood. Correct. And so we are saved by grace. All those other things go because we love God and we want to be pleasing to the Lord. How many want to be pleasing to God? So the promise never changes. So if this promise never changes, do not let the enemy, the devil, play mind games with you. You come along to God and you realize, all right, I'm a sinner. I, and, and, and how do I get saved? We get saved by realizing I'm a sinner. We know that Jesus died for us upon the cross. We know that he shed his blood for us. Uh, and we accept Jesus into our life. We are born again of the spirit of almighty God. We trust Jesus for salvation. And then the Bible teaches uh, that you are living. And if you're living the way the Lord wants you to live, then you are saved. And then you're going to go to heaven. That's how we we get saved. I'm a sinner. Jesus died for me. Come into my life, Jesus, and save me. I'm calling upon you. And Jesus, if you're sincere, he'll come in and wash away your sin. And then we get up, and then we take the word of God, and we begin to hide it in our heart that we might not sin against him, and then prepare ourselves to go to heaven. And then one of these days, either Jesus is going to come back and say, all right, let's go, or we're going to die, and we're going to meet the Lord then. But the most important thing thing is you've got to be ready. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. All right. Again, I'm not finding fault because I remember the night that I went to church when I was not saved. And you have to understand that Jesus can save you today. Maybe you've only been coming to church. Maybe you only have a church relationship. Well, guess what? Why don't you have a relationship with Jesus? Amen. Bible tells us in John chapter 6, verse 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Praise God for that.
That means we come to God in all of our sinfulness, in all of our unrighteousness, in all of our wretched ways, and say, God, my life stinks. My life is a wreck. God, save me. God, wash away my sin. And he comes in and he begins to clean you up and he washes away that sin. And then we get up with a heart full of gratitude and love for Jesus. Uh, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. God, it helped me to live for you every day. But pastor, what do I do if I mess up? All right, get down on your knees and say, Father, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me for committing that sin. Uh, and get up and do a 180 and go the other direction and repent of your sin and be right with God Amen. and then he has promised to supply us again the promise is very clear in Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus again I'm going to tell you that God can take care of us all right, so I'm not going to belabor the point too much, but really I'm going to go back. I wasn't even planning on saying that earlier, but you know, maybe you're having a hard time paying your tithe because you're not paying your tithe. God can take care of you. But we have a, the propensity of, you know, classifying God into certain areas of our life. We want to believe him for this. We want to believe him for salvation. We want to believe him for the Holy Ghost. We want to believe that he's good and he's going to take us to heaven. But, well, this over here, well, I don't really believe that. We can't pick and choose, friends. We have to live for God. And God will take care of us. And we have to be consistent. Amen? Sometimes in life for God, we, we, we uh, will do something for a week or two or one time or two times. And then we stop. And then we have to, six months later, you start again. It doesn't work that way. We have to be consistent. God will take care of you. Psalm said in Psalm 37 verse 25, he said, I've been young and now I'm old. Some of us have fulfilled that already, have we not? Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Now, where he said, I've not seen the righteous. I've not seen the saved. I'm not seeing those that are living for God forsaken. Now, you can't say that, that you uh, not had your needs met. You have to be righteous. You have to be saved. Amen? Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, the Lord will never let you down. Amen. Then he has promised to satisfy us. All right, so now in John chapter 4, we read about the woman at the well. And he promised her a drink of living water that would eternally satisfy her. John chapter 4 verses 13 to 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him as a well of water springing up into everlasting life. God can satisfy us on the inside. You can stop here and you can drink your water. It tastes good. And, and, but guess what? You're going to thirst again. You're going to go back. You're going to go back. You're going to go back. But that longing in our heart, that longing in our soul, only Jesus can satisfy. Amen. He promised to satisfy the hungry soul. Psalm 107 verse 9. For he satisfieth the longing soul. And filleth the hungry soul with goodness. I asked Saul this morning, are you hungry? He said, yes. I said, you're always hungry. He said, I know. <laughs> He's still hungry right now. That's all right. How many are hungry right now? See, you're not alone. Well, give me something to eat. I'm giving you some meat right now. A lot of scriptures this morning. Why? Because you understand. And so God is able to fill that hungry soul. How many remember how your life was before you got saved? You were looking, you were searching, and you're empty. You may not want to admit it, but you were empty. 
But when you came to God, there's just something about it that, that you felt fulfilled and you felt thankful and you were happy. Why? Because you know what? You can be really hungry, then you eat, and then all you want to do is just like, oh, man, that was so good. And you, and you can sleep easy. Amen? Here's the big question. If God can satisfy us, how many believe that? Why does it seem then that most Christians are unsatisfied? Why then are you looking for something else? A lot of people have never learned the secret to genuine contentment. Most Christians think that they need to have things to satisfy them. They've never learned to be happy with Jesus and what Jesus can give. There are people, I gotta get this, I gotta have that, I gotta, and then you get it, then where does it end up? Under the bed, on a shelf somewhere, right? Christmas is coming. I gotta have it, I gotta have the latest gizmo. How to chop an onion 14 different ways with this chopomatic thing. I gotta have these things. I gotta get the new iPhone. You just need to get an Android. That'll satisfy you once and for all. Amen? Raise your hand if you say amen to that, right? Well, look at all you Apple people, raise your hand. One, two, three. There's room at the cross for you. Come and pray right now and be converted. And you can get up from the altar and say, I saw the light. All the Apple people, I've lost all the Apple people. They're going to tune me out the rest of the service. Can I still go to dinner with you, Jim? <laughs> People are not satisfied. They've never learned to be happy. It would do us all well to remember that in Jesus, we find all that we need. Now, let me just back up. I don't care if you have an Apple phone. I'm just harassing you all. So... Don't, don't take that seriously, right? One of these days you'll evolve into righteousness. No, I just can't stop myself. The devil made me do it. How's that sound, right? I don't really care what phone you have. They're all phones after a while. In Jesus, we find everything that we need. He knows our needs. He knows what's going on in your heart and your life right now. He will take care of the things in the areas which we lack. And the promises of God continue on and on and on, but the promises of God are only for those that continue in the faith. See, again, you want the promises of God, but you're not continuing in the faith. Jesus Christ, forever the same. The same in power, his promises, and his personality. Hebrews 1 and 12 but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. This verse simply reaffirms the truth of our text that I read to you at the beginning, that Jesus Christ will never change. Therefore, any of his attributes that he possessed from the beginning, he will still possess today. He will possess them through all eternity in the future. That which he was, he is, and ever will be. Therefore, that means that his personality will never change. And praise God for that. That means that the Bible said in 1 John 4 and 8, For God is love. Our God is love. Uh, hallelujah for that, right? This is his very nature. That means he was loved then, he's loved now, and he'll be loving forevermore because he does not change. Everything he does is an expression and an outgrowth of his love, and he'll never change. It's his attributes. It's his personality. And if we have God living in us, and we conform ourselves to his image, that means that we're going to love as well. But I can't stand that person on the other side of the church. Well, Jesus loved them enough to die for. And since God is love... It means that there will never be a time when you will not be loved by God. Amen. Well, what if I die and go to hell? Will God still love me? He'll love you. But you made your choice. Well, if God is love, 
He won't send anyone to hell. And, and, and you've heard this before. God doesn't send anyone to hell. He just honors your choice. He'll still love you. It's just like when a parent has to correct a child. Their child is being corrected, but the parent still loves the child. Bible tells us in Jeremiah 31 and 3, Yea, I, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. God loved you before he saved you. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and I. You don't get make yourself godly and then get saved. We need Jesus to get saved and to become godly. And so be, because we were living in sin, God still loved us. And he loves you now. And he'll love you forever. And he is love. And you are the object of his love. It's mankind. He created man to fellowship with man, to walk with man, to be with man. And you know what? Let's fellowship with Jesus. Let's fellowship with the Lord. Let's do what we were created to do. Amen. He's love. And then he is. Just give me a couple more minutes. I still got like 10 minutes. They didn't sing today, so I got extra minutes. So praise God. I'm almost done. Praise God, preacher. God is eternal, but you don't have to be. <laughs> he is love and he is light. John 8 and 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. By the very nature, Jesus is light. Jesus is light. His very purpose in coming into the world was to bring the light of God to those of us that were drowning in the sea of darkness. He came to manifest or to make known the Father to follow fallen men. And even the Bible tells us, he that has seen me has seen the Father. He, he brought light into a darkened world. Aren't you glad that he brought his light into your darkened life and he gave you something to live for? He's still in the business of bringing light. And he is light and he ever will be. He offers hope. Hope to those that are still in darkness. And maybe you're in darkness today. Or maybe something has, has transpired in your life that brought darkness. Well, God can help you. He can bring you out of darkness into the light of God if you want to be brought out. See, there's, there's the key. You ought to want to be brought out. And some people are so entrenched in their sin. And they like it so much they don't want to be brought out into the light. I'm telling you right now, when you come to the light and let God be real to you, it's worth it all. Amen. It's worth it all. And then we know that he is life. John 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is not just another life. He is the life. He's the one that can give us life. It is in him and him alone that dead sinners can live. Praise God. I was once dead in my sins. I came to God and God set me free. And he gave me a life everlasting. Yeah. Bible said in Ephesians 2 and 1. And you hath he quickened. That means made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead in our sins. We were dead in the wrongdoings of life. But he made us alive. Why? Because he is alive. And he changes not. A little bit further down. Ephesians 2 and 5. Even when we were dead in sins. Hath quickened us. Or made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. We were dead. We were ungodly. But God saved us and made us alive dead gods can't do that for you to know Jesus is to know life and to be without him is to abide in death 1 John 5 and 12 we're keeping the, the computer guy busy today with all these scriptures he that hath a son hath life now listen to this last part and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now, those of us that are saved, we have life. Amen. But if you don't have Jesus, 
You don't have life. Thus saith the word of God. He is life. And he ever will be life. He's the, remember, the creator of life. And because he is a creator of life, he is a sustainer of life. This will never change. Again, regardless of what you say. For a man to truly live, you must know Jesus. The Bible says, John 1 and 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I want to be a son of God. Amen? Amen. I want to be a child of the king. In John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Praise God, right? Amen. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. How many believe? Amen. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now that's a pretty serious verse of Scripture. We believe, and if we believe, if we believe in something, that means it's going to affect our behavior. And because we do not believe something, it will affect our behavior. Right? So if we believe on the Son, and we're doing what the Son tells us to do. So there's things in there, I just, I'll just believe, and it's all good to go. If we believe something, we're going to act upon it. Right? Right? But if you believe not, you don't believe the Son, you're not going to have eternal life. But it's even worse than that. The wrath of God is abiding upon you. I, I don't want God mad at me. Is God mad at you today? Is God looking at you saying, you know, you know, you need to get some things squared away in your life. Let God speak to your heart. And God is saying, you know, you know, I, I, I got something to say to you. You, know, you. you say that you believe on my son. And I want to give you everlasting life. But you're not behaving like a good son. You don't even come visit your father. <laughs> Uh-oh. I got something against you. I don't want God saying that to me. I don't want the wrath of God abiding upon my heart and my life. There's more to, there's more to living for God than, and than just saying that I believe in Jesus. Thank God for his love and his life. And then he, lastly, he is Lord. Acts 2.36 God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. No one makes Jesus the Lord of their life. What do you, what do you mean by that? He's already Lord, whether you and, I, you and I acknowledge it or not. If you walk out of here and you never acknowledge Jesus as Lord, and you die and go to hell, you do whatever you want to do, but guess what? He'll always be Lord. It changes not. Nobody makes Jesus the Lord of their life. And the world certainly does not live like Jesus is Lord, but that changes nothing. The word Lord means ruler. He is the boss of our life. How many would say Jesus is the Lord of your life? Amen. Well, that means when he says to do something, we need to do it whether we feel like it or not. And you're here this morning in the house of the Lord, so praise God. But you know... Uh, it's all we, at least we can do is give God an hour on a Sunday morning. He died for us. Yes, and some people can't even give God an hour. Right. But we don't live for God just on Sunday morning. Amen. Lord means ruler. Yes. Jesus, you're my Lord. You're my ruler. But I want you to do this. Well, about that. I don't know about all that. Mm. There's so many things I could say right now, but you'd probably be severely mad at me. So God's not letting me say it, so I'm not going to say it. Amen? 
Let God speak to your heart. Many churches and many Christians do not live like he is Lord. And you may not live like Jesus is the Lord of your life. But that does not change anything. He's still Lord. And, and you, you, churches may not do that. Churches may, acknowledge, may not acknowledge Jesus. Now I'm talking this whole message is about Jesus. Right? We're going to lift up Jesus. That's our goal. That's our plans. Right? And whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we, we say he's our Lord, he is still Lord. God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus is Lord. He'll ever be the Lord. He is Lord. Amen. He is Lord, and the best you and I can do is to live like we know it, and we honor it. Giving honor to our God. Jesus Christ, forever the same. Is he truly your Lord today? It's amazing to me. And I, again, I've done this for 40 years, and I'm not perfect, and I, I need help, just like everybody else. But I don't understand how some of you say that you're saved, and yet Jesus is your Lord, but you dictate terms to God. I just don't get that. Well, Pastor Jessica, you're not smart. Well, praise God, pray for me. I still don't get it. How that you say he's your Lord, but... We look around and you're doing your own thing. And you fit God in when it's convenient. The world around us, come to the instruments, please. The world around us, even our very lives, are in a constant state of flux. Things are always changing, the military changes. Areas change. Life changes. We change physically, on and on and on. Lots of changes. And it's very refreshing to know and very comforting to know that the God that we serve and the Lord that we received when we got saved as our Savior, that our God will never change. Perhaps... There's needs in your life today, right now in this service. Perhaps you need to come to him and share your burdens to him and find help from an unchangeable God, from an unchangeable Lord. He loves you and he's here to help you if you will come to him and call upon his name. Here's my question. Some of you have been around a long time. But this is for all of us. Will you come to the Lord? Jesus Christ forever the same. As you bow your heads.